So we are in your history book, American history book, and we're going over the Constitution of the United States of America in chapter seven, um, part two. And going into this, we were talking about how all of, you know, they were they all got together, the Constitution in Philadelphia there, um, getting together and putting forth the smaller states wanting to have as many votes as the larger states and the larger states wanted to have their votes on population so that they could have more votes. And it didn't start off so good, did it? The argument got heated and then Ben Franklin stood up and gave scriptures and everyone prayed, huh? <laughs> Amazing. So the great compromise would happen in July. So remember, it, they started the constitution in May and now it's July. To satisfy the smaller states, they would have what's called the Connecticut Compromise. Now, most books would say the Great Compromise, because if this compromise was not made, we probably wouldn't have a constitution. So the Connecticut Compromise, as Connecticut, Connecticut took, you know, took hold of this here, basically said they would have a national government with two houses, two houses, bicameral, bi meaning two, bicameral, like two humps, two houses. Like a, I always think of two humps like a cam, uh, camel, <laughs> but it's camerol. So the the first the first would be the Senate, and the Senate would be um, have you know um, two senators from each state. They're not going to go by population. Every state would just send two senators, right? And that would be the upper house called the Senate. The lower house would call the House of Representatives, and it would be based on population of the state. And all of these in the populations of the state, they would all be selected by voters. So the voters would have to go in their district and vote for their representatives from that district of that state. So they would have a lot more, lot more people represented in the House of Representatives, the lower house. So they'd have an upper house and the lower house. This is called bicameral or bicameral legislature. And this would be to make laws. Of course, the, the Congress, this is called Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives called Congress, and they would make the laws. And so very important that they have um, representative from each state now and two senators. So this was the great compromise and it saved the convention and saved the, the Union of the United States, really. Because the young, the, the little states, smaller states, oh yeah, we'll have, yeah, we can go by, we'll have um, just two senators from each state for the upper house. We can send two and, and Virginia will send two, New Jersey send two, Delaware two, New York two, right? And then the House of Representatives would be by population, by the people. And so they agreed and this balanced everything out. So this was, this Connecticut compromise or great compromise oh, is, was so important. They had other compromises too. They had what's called the three-fifths compromise. And now we had, we had a problem um, between the small states and the big states. And now we have, have a problem between the northern states and the southern states. You see in the northern states, they didn't have slaves as they did in the southern states. So the southern states wanted to count their, their population so they can have more representative um, count and count their count their slaves, uh, but they didn't want to count their their slaves if they're being taxed because they don't want to be taxed a lot on their people, right? So they said, well, we don't want to count the, count the slaves for for taxation. There are there are workers, but with our slaves, we want to count them um, for our um, population so we can have more representatives. So the North opposed this view and says. Uh, you're, you're counting people that are not, you know, the citizens, not necessarily citizens are coming from Africa, you know, so they said basically we're saying no. And so they had to have, they put forth a compromise, which is kind of, you know, a compromise like, oh my goodness, okay, because we're talking about slavery. And of course the North did not like state slaves or want slaves. And there were a lot, especially the Federalists that were anti-slavery. But in the South, they had slaves in the plantations. So basically they said three-fifths. So they said three-fifths of the slave population would be counted. So here we go. That meant the states of the North and the South could not agree. So it was decided that five slaves would count as three people. And that's how they would use for taxing, to tax them, and also um, for giving them representatives for, for the Congress to count their population. <laughs> 
Commerce and slave compromise was another. The commerce and slave population, we're talking about slaves again. Remember, this is before, you know, this is before slavery was outlawed, you know, and that didn't come until Abraham Lincoln, you know, Emancipation Proclamation. That's a long ways down the road. So there was a power to regulate interstate and foreign commer commerce was very important, but they disagreed on the details of commerce. The North would tightly, the Northern states tightly regulated and levied taxes, um, taxes on imported goods. So, and this protected American manufacturing as though there were a lot of companies, manufacturing companies that were starting in the North. In the South, there was dependence on agriculture, of course, on the plantations, and the South feared that Congress just might outlaw the importation of slaves. They thought the Congress might decide we don't want slavery. They actually should have done this long before. They should have outlined slavery right here, but instead they com compromised on slavery. So they were afraid at that point that if they, if they went against slavery at this moment, we would have a civil war even then, right? So anyway, so the South, so they compromised and the commerce and slave trade um, compromise was called and it granted Congress to regulate commerce with certain limitations and it could not levy or export, um, levy export tar tariffs, tariffs, we'll talk about that later. And it could not regulate trade, but they put a date at least to 1808. So the compromise was, as for the northern states who did not want slavery at all, especially the Federalists then, at that time, they said, okay, we'll wait a little bit longer, but not too long. 1808 was, would not, was not too far ahead. But the South said, okay, we'll take that for now. So Congress could not regulate slave for another 20 years. It's not that good of a thing, right? So the bundle of compromises. We have another compromise that's very important, and this is called the Electoral College that would elect the president. Remember, under the Articles of Confederation, they didn't even have a president. So now they would have a president, and they would have to elect this president. Would this president serve for their whole lifetime, you know, like a king? Or would the president only be a president for one year? And what would the president do? You know, um, all these things were big questions. And so they decided to compromise on a four-year term and say a president could have four years of president presidency and then he could be re-elected re for another four years. Well, at that time, it was just re-elected again. They had to be, a president would have to be re-elected. He could be four years to be president, but then he had to be re-elected. And that's what we have now, right? And so the president would be chose directly by the voters but the voters would come from what was called, and we still have that system, the Electoral College. The Electoral, let me move this over so you can see better. The Electoral College was, is what we even use today. Each state has electors as representatives in, the, in their state. And they have their own method of selecting electors at that time, and each would cast two ballots. And the candidate with the most electoral votes would be president of the United States. And the second highest candidate would be vice president. And this doesn't work anymore. This is long changed because what happened, we'll find later on that we had, we would have um, the, the president and the vice president would be from two different parties. You know, in fact, that, that's what happened. We'd have a federal, federalist president with a, with um, a Republican, a Democrat Republican vice president. That happened, you know, that happened, you know, um, as our second president of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. They did not get along, and they were president and vice president. But at this time, the one with the most electoral votes would be president. They didn't have to worry too much about this because everyone knew who would be president. You know, if George Washington um, stood to be president, everyone supported him. This is the Electoral College. This, is, this was another type of compromise in the first four-year term. Instead of elected for life or one year, they would be elected for four years. The many compromises they went through as they, they went through the, the, the Constitution with the states, the Constitution resolved to put aside local interests, basically saying, okay, let's put aside our local interests so we can really make this happen, you know, or really let God make it happen. To produce the Constitution acceptable to the people from all sections of the country and for all time, they had to put some of their own things aside, you know, their, their 
own thoughts aside. America had to become a strong nation and, and needed to be based on biblical principles and had to recognize man's rights and man's responsibilities. And so the Constitution of Convention, as we see here, would be in the compromise, the great compromise, there would be a bundle of compromises, of course, as they put forth, but um, looking to the best of the total, of the whole country, not just their state, but the whole country was so important. The men of the Constitution were men of character, principle, and understanding. It says there has never an assembly of men charged with a great and arduous trust who were more pure in their motives or more exclusively or anxiously devoted to the object committing them. James Madison, he said, these men were totally committed, committed to the United States government as a whole. Uh, and so the Constitution was adopted by the states. And these are the signers of the Constitution, pictures of them. You know, the 55 delegates, the 55 signers of the Constitution. The states adopt the Constitution. So how? Now what happens, the states, they have to go back to their states and they have to tell their state and the state, their states have to ratify, they call it ratification of the Constitution. The states have to, they have to say yes, and we're, we are going to ratify, we're going to sign, but ratify the Constitution and say the Constitution is going to be for our state. You can't just have one delegate, you know, or two delegates or how many delegates you send, all these men getting together. The states, each state, individual state had to ratify. And so they had to be signed by the delegates, but then they had to be ratified to be official. Um, they had to, to be by state, the state conventions of delegates elected by the voters. The voters had to elect, actually elect the delegates now. Nine states were needed to ratify, but they really needed all the states. And it says, shall be sufficient, nine shall be sufficient for the establishment of the Constitution. But in some states, they opposed the Constitution at that time. Um, the topic became heated in some states. The Federalists, when you talk about Federalists, Federalists were those that wanted the Constitution, needed the Constitution, and they, they were all out gung-ho for the Constitution. They were called Federalists. And they wanted a closer unit, union of the United States and a stronger government. They said, we need a stronger government. But there were some anti-Federalists then that opposed the ratification of the Constitution. Well, see here, here's, this is the sign they were, um, as they ratified, they were stars. And we'll talk about that because at first we'll have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, getting ratified. And well, Virginia has a problem and we'll see some of the other problems. The Federalists. We're talking about the Federalists here. Alexander Hamilton, of course, he is a prodigy of George Washington. He's definitely, you know, he's all out for the Constitution of the United States of America. We have James Madison of Virginia. He was the father of the Constitution. He's all out. And then we have John Jay, which would later become uh, our attorney general uh, in the court, a judge. And he, these three were the main that wrote the Federalists. They wrote articles about the Federalists, about the Constitution, and, and recommended through their, their letters that these letters that they wrote and pamphlets they gave out everywhere, you know, to, to say how we need this new government, how we need this Constitution. They had a problem between the federal and the state, which we still have today. The federal um, pulling together, like, okay, we need a stronger, we need a stronger um, um, bond between us. We need to get, we need, we need an army. We need all these things, right? And the state pulling, say, well, we'll just, we states, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can. And that's happening even today. And now we have a different situation, totally different than it was back then. The Federalists are not, not anymore, and, and the Democrat Republics are not either. You know, so anyway, um, but we won't talk about that now. The Federalists were mainly merchants, bankers, lawyers, manufacturers, clergymen, plantation owners. They're a variety, a variety. And most of, most of them were well-to-do, either middle class or well-to-do. And many had fought in the War from Independence. They were strong, they're, they're strong-minded men from being independent of, of um, England. 
and, and they wanted a strong government to protect their, not only their financial interests, but, but to, to for, for protect them against foreign powers. If foreign countries came in and attacked us, we could not. If we didn't have a central government, we could not um, raise an army at all. And so, and to protect our financial interests of the country, that when we did take money for taxes, we needed to put it somewhere, and and we needed to have a currency that was all for the country, not just for one state. You know, you know, dollar bills from um, Virginia and dollar bills from Rhode Island wouldn't be the same, right? So we needed to have that, and we needed to have a um, a prosperous and powerful United States. And so the Federalists. Their whole thing was to get together. I have to tell you, you know, Jay and Madison, I think Jay wrote, wrote about um, how many articles about, I don't know, about eight or so articles. And uh, Madison wrote like 28, 20 some. There were like 85 Alexander Hamilton wrote, you know, 50 some articles. He was the main Federalist and he was basically a representative, I should say, of George Washington. anti federalists They were against this. They, they didn't oppose America becoming, um, you know, being power, um, opposing America because of powerful or being powerful or opposing the Union in per se. They had certain reasons for, for opposing the Constitution. They said America needed some new form of government. They knew if it's going to survive. But they wanted the, basically, they wanted the articles of the Constitution of the Confederacy to be, you know, put together. And they don't, didn't want a strong government. Um, but they did not. They uh, did not want this constitution. They didn't think the constitution was the best approach. Is what they thought. They didn't want states to lose their powers, right? So they thought if this happens, the states are going to lose their power, and we're going to turn into some place like they have over in Europe, you know, with the, with the kings and the queens controlling and everything. One of the main anti-federalists was one of the greatest patriots of all time in America was Patrick Henry. And he believed they ignored the sovereignty of the states and that we were going to have get together, we're going to have some despo or I should say tyrant running in the long run. And so he said it was we the people are, are we the states. So he says, who's authorizing this, you know, together that we are the states, we are the people, individual states. So he was not really into this federalist business, right? He said the, the Constitution had no Bill of Rights, and that was a big point. The Constitution did not have a Bill of Rights. He said, we need to have a Bill of Rights. So one thing good that Patrick Henry did say is that we need to have a Bill of Rights, and right, the rights that go along with this Constitution, that the people will have these rights, and that did form. And he said he needed, we needed protection from a uh, tyrant-type government, right? And so these anti-federalists, here's a couple. Samuel Adams was another one, and he was a big patriot. And George Mason, they got together, and they thought, no, we can't go. We're, we're afraid of this Constitution. One thing they, they said, they needed a Bill of Rights. The anti-federalist papers were Patrick Henry. No. The Federalist Advantage. The Federalist Advantage. The Federalist had advantage over the anti-federalists. Why? Number one. They had support of George Washington. Everyone stood up for George Washington. I mean, George Washington uh, was the commander in chief of the Revolutionary War, you know? So the Federalists had George Washington. Alexander Hamilton was like his right hand man, right? And most and best of the experienced political leaders were Federalists already, right? A lot of the political leaders were Federalists. They wanted to have a strong, stronger um, national government. The Federalists offered a positive program to solve the nation's problems. They had a program. The Federalists set forth, of course they had a program. They had Alexander Hamilton, he's the genius of the programs, and they set together, uh, would set together the program of how they had to, we were in debt. We owed, owed nations, including France, a lot of money, right? And we owned a lot of people, so the Federalists had a, pro, a, pro, a program to, to be able to pay back our debts and get out of debt. The Anti-Federalists had no unified constructive plan at all. They just said, we just don't want the Constitution. We need another one in place. But they had no, no um, other program to say, oh, this one would be better. 
So they just were against it, but the Federalists were like, we got it, we know exactly. We have a program, here it is. The Constitution. The Federalist success. So nine states um, ratified the Constitution quite quickly. So we have, of course they need to ratify this Constitution. Nine states um, did it quickly. Delaware was the first state. In fact, it's still called the first state. So if you go to Delaware, it says we are the first state because they signed, the, they ratified the Constitution right away. Number one, Uno one, Delaware. First state on December 7th, 1787. The next four states quickly followed Delaware. Pennsylvania, oh, it was all go. Well, they were, the, the convention was in Philadelphia. New Jersey, yeah, we like this. New Jersey liked it. Georgia, Georgia liked it. And Connecticut, Connecticut did the Kennedy Compromise. These states, one, two, three, four, five, right away. Then came Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, of course, we have a lot of Federalists, but there are some Anti-Federalists, especially when we think of Samuel Adams was one. And so they had a struggle, and that's where the federal, uh, one of the areas, besides New York, and but um, well, one of the areas where the federal pa papers really did a, did a lot was Massachusetts, as Alexander ha Hamilton came in in Massachusetts and bringing forth the Federalist in the anti, in the anti but there was, they went on, and there was a need, they realized, okay, the anti-federal, with the anti-federalists and with Samuel Adams, they, they needed a need for individual rights, which would be the Bill of Rights, that goes on to the Constitution. Massachusetts ratified it after John Hancock and Samuel Adams, remember they weren't at the, they weren't even chose to go to the Constitution. They finally gave their approval of the Constitution, finally, and in the midst of all of this. And they too thinking, well, we need a bill, if we have, we have a bill of rights, we need to have a bill of our rights. We can't have a Constitution without a bill of individual rights. Then from Massachusetts, you know, here we have um, Massachusetts came, Maryland and South Carolina. They followed right along Massachusetts a few months later, thinking, okay, Massachusetts does, we will. <laughs> and then on to um, New Hampshire became the ninth state. So New Hampshire becomes the ninth state here. here here's, here's New Hampshire. We have nine states. They say, woo, we can, yeah, we got nine states now. We can be a constitution, but not really. There was a couple big states. They knew they could, we could not be a nation without these big states. Virginia and New York, they hadn't ratified the Constitution. You know, so we'll have, so Virginia and New York. So Virginia, without Virginia and New York, there would be little success of the Constitution. So in Virginia, what was happening? In Virginia, the anti-federalists led by Patrick Henry, of course, and his gang, um, Patrick Henry and George uh, Mason, they had a powerful struggle in Virginia. Finally, the Federalists led by James Madison, remember he's a Virginian, and he was putting forth the Federalist Papers, and he was actually the father of the Constitution, um, and Governor Randolph, who was the governor of Virginia, they swung enough voters on June 25th, 1788, and uh, Virginia ratified the Constitution. But they, do, they like Massachusetts, they put forth a, stip, a stipulation and said, we'll not ratify it unless we have a Bill of Rights. So we knew the Bill of Rights would have to be, right? So New York, well, New York is where the Federalist Papers were Rampant, not anti-Federalist paper, Federalist paper. New York, the governor of New York, his name was George Clinton. He was an anti-Federalist and he opposed Alexander Hamilton all the way. Remember Alexander Hamilton wrote the Federalist Papers practically. And so with the help of John Jay and James Madison, Hamilton published a series of 85 essays. And these were arguments in favor of the Constitution. Like I said, um, Alexander Han uh, Hamilton, I think, wrote like in the 50s, you know, he wrote most of them. And these papers went far and wide. And Hamilton was great at persuading people, the people there, in the, in the ratification of the Constitution. And so New York did end up ratifying the Constitution on June 26, 1788. A new government.
Congress made this plan now to put the new government into operation. So they chose New York City would be the capital of the United States temporarily. And then plans were made for uh, presidential and um, congressional elections in 1789. We need to, they needed uh, elections for president. And the first federal elections would be made by voters. There would be a new House of Representatives and a state um, legislature of senators and electing them. And uh, most of this time, most of the ones that were elected were Federalists. G but George Washington, of course, here, he was unanimously elected as the first president of the United States of America. Everyone said, yay, we want not one single vote went against George Washington. The last states ratify. Remember, we okay, we have, we have New York and we have Virginia, but there were still two states that kind of held back and they were smaller states, the smallest state in fact. North Carolina ratified in November of 1789, but then we have Rhode Island. Rhode Island never really wanted to come to the convention. Rhode Island opposed strong government altogether, but Rhode Island did not want to be a foreign power. He said, we're, well, we need to be part of this because if we are, we're going to be, our little, little state here is going to be all on its own, a foreign part, we'll, have, we'll be foreign to the rest of them. So Rhode Island ratified on May 29th, 1790, and it was the last of the 13 original colonies to ratify the Constitution. So we'll begin with what happens then.